Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 12th session of our foundation course in palliative care. This is Sri Priya along with Mr. Anu welcoming you all to the session. Today, as we progress towards the 12th session, we'll be discussing with uh, children in palliative care settings. And uh, it is indeed our privilege and pleasure to have one of the most apt personalities from another part of the world, to be precise, to open through the session. So for formal faculty introduction for the session facilitation, I invite uh, Ms. Deepa Jose, who is joining us as the facilitator for the day. With that, it is over to you, Deepa. Thank you, Subhiti. And uh, a warm welcome to the 12th session of the board. And today, we are going to see uh, the palliative care settings for children. And uh, uh, we have a wonderful personality, Mr. Joanne Master. And uh, I'm taking the privilege to welcome you, ma'am. And uh, as uh, when we look into our profile, it is uh, like uh, she's a professional nurse, advocate, manager, and educator working in palliative and hospice care for the uh, last 34 years at local, national, and global level with a focus on children's palliative care and more. Recently, palliative care in humanitarian settings. She's a vice president of the Elizabeth Kuller Foundation Global. And the co-founder of first uh, co-founder, first chair and CEO of the ICPTN, which is the International Children's Quality Care Network, and presently a global ambassador for the ICPTN. Also, she's a co-founder and executive committee member responsible for advocacy in quality chase. This is palliative care in uh, humanitarian aid situations and emergencies. Also, founder of uh, St. Nicholas, uh, uh, now on Sunflower, Children's Hospice in Bloemfontein, South Africa in 1998, and on the management team. Experience in, in with, uh, envisioning, setting up, and managing palliative care organizations at all levels from a local hospice to a national and international network. Advocacy, networking, education, fundraising, strategic planning, and project management at local, national, and international level. She is passionate about palliative care, especially in children and the vulnerable population uh, in the humanitarian city. So I welcome you, ma'am, for the session. Thank you. And me there. Thank you so much. I'm going to um, try and share my own screen if that's all right, because it might be easier for the presentation. And just to say thank you so much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to see an old friend, Mansi Shah, who we've walked a long journey together and to see familiar faces. And a special thank you today to my good friend, Bobby Mitchley, who has not only allowed me to connect to her internet because we have power outages where I, where I live, but has also provided me with a nice pot of coffee. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen, if that will be all right with you. Uh, uh, can you see that? Okay. Yes, ma'am. That looks good. Thank you. So as you, as you know, I've worked in children's palliative care for many years, and it really is my great passion in life. So, um, oh dear, it's not moving forward. Oh, here we go. All right. So just to say, you've been learning about palliative care, and I see I come in at number 12, which is great, because you have all the principles of palliative care. And when we're working with children, the principles remain the same. What makes the difference is the child because we're working with tiny little newborns right through all the ages into young adults. And so we need not only the knowledge of the principles of palliative care, we need a different skill set when we're working with these different children and working with their families. So who is the child in palliative care? Well, we often think about it only as being the patient, but of course it's not. It's the patient who is the most important child in palliative care, but it's also the siblings. It's the child who's a caregiver of their parents. And I think in India and in Africa, we see this so often. And of course, it's also the child of a sick parent who's learning to deal 
with the grief and loss and with all that goes along, the emotions that go along with, um, with caring for an adult. And we need to remember that there are different stages and ages. So normally we would talk about a child in UNICEF terms of being between the ages of birth and 18 to 21. Because in palliative care for children, we often deal with conditions that last over many years and take these children into not only young adulthood, but sometimes into middle age, that we often stretch the age limits of children's palliative care for those uh, young people. We also need to remember that the child we're caring for, and we're going to focus on the child as the patient today, is somebody's son or daughter. The child is an individual, a unique individual who's growing and developing, developing their own personality. And it's something that we need to take into account because we have to change and develop with that child. And it's a child who's becoming. Some will only become a slightly older child. Some will only live for a few days or a few hours, but that child is changing and becoming. And we always need to remember that these children that we deal with are especially vulnerable. They have all the vulnerabilities of childhood as well as the vulnerabilities that come with their illness or their condition. And around that is the impact of where and how they live. And you working in India, myself working in Africa, we know the, the huge impact of poverty and increasing poverty. It leads to lack of access to health um, services, to families not being able to cope, to care for the child at home. And this is, is something that we always have to remember are the social impacts on the child. And there's an increasing uh, incidence of children caught up in war, in civil unrest, and in other humanitarian crises, such as climate change. Um, and we're seeing this all around the world. And at the moment, of course, in your region, we're seeing the impact in Myanmar and in Bangladesh, especially with the, um, with the refugees who are living in Cox's Bazaar. Now, listen, I think we always need to remember, Sister Frances Dominica is one of the great pioneers of children's palliative care and the founder of the first um, children's hospice house, Helen House in 1982. And what she always reminds us is that we aren't the great people who know so much. We actually are the learners, we are the pupils. The child and the family are the teachers. And with every child and family we come in contact with, it is a masterclass and we have to be open to new learning and new growing in ourselves as well. And there's Sister Frances. And I think that's the face of children's palliative care is people think of it as always sad. And of course it's not. There's lots of times of smiles and laughter. So we need to define palliative care. Of course, we need to look at different definitions. What makes it different to adult palliative care? So while there are many similarities, there are a lot of differences as well. We're going to look at the different categories of children who require palliative care. And then at how we provide holistic care, remembering that that child is consists of body, mind, and essentially spirit as well, which we often forget. And then briefly at end of life care, because end of life care is only a very small part of what we do in palliative care. Some of the children we care for, you will see in the categories, actually might live to fairly old age with their condition provided it is well controlled. But we know that the impact of poverty also leads to the fact that uh, children with conditions like HIV do not comply to treatment or do not reach treatment centers. So what is pediatric palliative care or children's palliative care or palliative care for children? They all mean exactly the same thing. Um, medical people like to use the term pediatric palliative care. Uh, many of us prefer talking about children because we're not dealing with pediatrics, we're dealing with children. Um, but whatever you choose to call it is absolutely fine. And the essence of palliative care is the relief of serious health-related suffering and the improvement 
of quality of life. And that suffering takes many forms and it is suffering of the body, mind and the spirit. But we can improve their quality of life and help in some small way with interventions that are in response to the suffering of the child and the family, rather than just to the disease. The World Health Organization, very, very early on, in fact, as early as 1998, recognized that children were different. And so they had a separate definition for palliative care for children. And to my mind, it's better than the, the general definition because it talks about the active total care of the child's body, mind, and spirit and involves giving support to the family. And then it begins when the illness is diagnosed and continues regardless of whether or not a child receives treatment directed at the disease. So we don't say either palliative care or curative treatment, they can go along, alongside. And in fact, it is better if palliative care can come in at time of diagnosis. And of course, as you know, it is holistic. It requires a broad multidisciplinary um, approach. It involves the family and makes use of community resources and can be given wherever the child is. So whether preferably in the child's own home, if the home is suitable for care. But I think this is probably a better definition because it is given by Matty Stepanek. Matty lived till nearly 13 with a neurodegenerative condition that three of his other siblings had died from and his mother also suffers from. She is still alive. A very wise old soul who wrote beautiful poetry from the age of three. And he is well worth Googling and reading some of his poetry on heart songs. And he said, palliative care for children no longer means helping children to die well. It means helping children to live well. And then when the time is certain to help them to die gently. And I think that's probably a good definition we can all use to live well and to die gently. So it goes from before birth. If a baby in uterus is diagnosed with a life limiting condition, or perhaps even dies in uterus, it's a time that we can prepare the, the parents and prepare for the birth so that we can make memories if we know that this child is not going to live for very long. And we require education, knowledge and skills. We need to be adaptable because we may be dealing with this child from that little neonate right through all the ages of childhood into young adulthood. We need to have different communication skills for all ages because you're not going to talk to a three-year-old the way you talk to a 16-year-old. We need experience. So theory is not enough. We also need to gain practical experience. And if we're going to do this work, we also need a sense of wonder because children are continually wondering at the changes in their world. And it's always provided within the framework of children's rights. So we know about the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the right to health, the right to a name and an identity, the right to education, um, and many other rights that are, are entrenched there that India and South Africa have signed. But we also have within our countries and within our regions, legislation that does more detailed protection of those rights. So we need to remember that we are actually advocates for children's rights as well. And to work in the field of pediatric palliative care or children's palliative care, we have to understand the different ages in development um, and also to remember that we may be dealing with a child who is developmentally delayed because of their illness or may actually have developed into a, a wise old soul who because of their illness and their interaction with adults and with the whole health system actually develops a knowledge and a wisdom way beyond their actual years. We have to understand the culture of childhood because culture, um, childhood has its own culture and the languages of childhood that may not always be words, they may express in play, in art, in the way they use their bodies, 
um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, the way they express their emotions and how they learn and understand. And we also always need to remember that children are spiritual beings and they have a spiritual awareness that sometimes takes us by absolute surprise. So how many children need palliative care? Well, a few years ago, we did some research with UNICEF and we identified that at least 21 million children would benefit from palliative care. So that's a lot of children. And 98% of them live in low and middle income countries like India, like South Africa. So the great bulk of these children are actually in countries that have limited resources. And in the countries that are high resourced, are lesser numbers of children. So it's, there is this great divide between resource rich countries and resource poor countries. And yet despite that, we are seeing pretty good development in some low and middle income countries. So yourselves in India, you have across India, you have wonderful programs, Pallium India, Happy Feet Home with Mansi in Mumbai, um, Dr. Gautri Palat's program in Hyderabad, all over the country you have fantastic programs and the same in South Africa. And yet not every child has access to palliative care. And you can see on this map, the darkest green are the high resource countries. So of course, North America, um, Europe, Australia and New Zealand, but India, South Africa, Malawi, recognizes the poorest country on the planet, Uganda. These all have some quite advanced children's palliative care. And yet only around 5% of children in the world who need palliative care are receiving it. So we all have a lot to do. And children in humanitarian crises, caught up in wars, those in Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh, in Ukraine at the moment, in, in Sudan, they have the same right to palliative care as every other child. And yet there are even greater barriers to them receiving it. Because we know that at least now that number has gone up from 303 million um, in need of humanitarian aid and 75% of them are women and children, at least 35 million children in humanitarian crises. And again, most of them in low and middle income countries. So you can see that we need to learn from low and middle income countries like in India, like in Africa, we've learned to do a lot with min minimal resources. And there's in any kind of humanitarian crisis, so whether it's a climate crisis or whether it is a conflict crisis, um, there is an increase in premature births. And in an acute crisis, we find that sometimes even more than 50% of births are premature or complex. And this says to us, we need to do much more in um, neonatal and perinatal palliative care as well. So what makes it different to adult palliative care? You've learned a lot about adults, but in children, there's a changing pathophysiology of illness in the child as they grow and develop so the illness can change and present in different ways. The unique diagnoses, some that we never see in adults. And so um, adult palliative care programs are not prepared to care for these children. Some have genetic conditions that may affect more than one child. The way medications work in their bodies, the type of non-pharmacological interventions that we might provide, and of course here play, and distraction is very, very important. And then of course, the impact of a sick child on the family and on the community is greater than an adult usually. And the impact on other children, they might go to school, their friends, their schools, and of course, very, very importantly, their siblings. And as I've mentioned, the impact on the child's development physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Some prognoses are very unclear. We don't know what's going to happen with these children because they have these rare conditions and they're unpredictable. Um, the way we communicate, I've mentioned before. And then of course, 
the death of a child, the loss of a child, the bereavement in children and families, the impact that that has, and the ongoing lifetime bereavement and grief. And many causes of death in children are different from those in adults. So our guidelines that we have so often for adults are not suitable for children. Um, and we've spoken about the developmental needs as well and how the illness impacts on that. And this is Juan, a little South African boy who's doing really well with his Pompey disease. But this is the list of side effects of the medication that he takes, which is nearly as great or possible side effects, let's say, is nearly as, as long as he is. So the most common conditions that we see globally is HIV, premature births and birth trauma, congenital anomalies, injuries, and cancer. And when most children live in the world who have palliative care needs, in Africa, over 50%, and Southeast Asia, nearly 20%. So you can see the, this vast number of children in these areas where resources are most limited. And so there are inequalities within and between countries. Um, and disparities are caused mainly, and I say this as an advocate, political decisions. If there is not political will, you will not have palliative care for children. And so we have to keep on pushing our politicians, our governments. We also see that many countries have very fragile health systems, those that are, are caught up in ongoing conflicts, especially, and the lack of resources, the lack of human, financial, educational resources, and of course, medication, and especially those like opioids, and of course, discrimination, which is sometimes entrenched in law as well. And I think this is, again, one of the great pioneers of palliative care for children. Um, and she is Dr. Liz Molino, who worked in Malawi. And I think her mantra was always do things simply and do them well. And so if we're working in resource poor countries, I think that's a mantra we all should remember. Do things simply and do them well. And so which children need palliative care? Well, there are four different categories. I'm not going to go into these in great detail, but category one is life-threatening conditions for which curative treatment may be feasible, but can fail. And so here we think of children with certain types of cancer who may, the treatment may lead to remission or it may not. Um, we think also of HIV, where if children are kept on the antiretrovirals, they can do well, but if social impact of poverty, of lack of access to, to health care comes in, then those children actually will die and certain types of organ failure. There are other conditions where we know when they are diagnosed early on, that while we can control the, the um, progress and slow it down in these conditions, that eventually these children, even though they reach young adulthood, will probably die unless they have interventions like the cystic fibrosis, like um, a heart and lung transplant, um, a heart and lung transplant, which is usually not accessible, and uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. The third are progressive conditions without any curative treatment and which will just progress and probably progress quite. Um, quite rapidly over a number of years, but will lead to an early death. And then the fourth is um, something that I saw a lot working in India, is that where children have non-progressive conditions, if they have good health care, um, and these conditions cause severe disability like cerebral palsy, um, traumatic cord injuries, complex health needs, um, that there's the likelihood of premature death because of the lack of resources and the lack of really complex care for these children. Then communication. If you look at this picture of Seho, who is actually our administrator, but who loves babies, and where there's a baby in Sunflower House comes, always rushes to bath the babies. Even though there's no words there, you can see the communication in the way they are looking at each other. 
at each other. So the way that they communicate and the way that we communicate is going to change from babies right throughout and take different forms. And sadly, when I see Lucy, Lucy died just a couple of weeks ago, very, very famous person in advocacy for palliative care, who had a, um, a rare neurodegenerative condition, um, but was a very vocal advocate for palliative care. Um, and she died recently, but I think her words when after many years of having lots of different tests by different groups of, of uh, medical specialists said eventually when they referred her to a hospice for young people, she said for the first time, someone wanted to know about me, Lucy, who I was and not just my bodily systems and diagnosis. And so children also communicate very comfortably to the sacred in their search for meaning. And if you haven't read Children's Letters to God, I do advise you to try and get a copy. It's an old book, but I think children's communication comes here, through here so clearly. From Norma, who asked about the giraffe. Dear God, did you mean for giraffe to look like that? Or was it an accident? And when we look at them with their long necks, we can understand that question. To Daniel, who was aged eight, who asked the question that I think that we often ask ourselves as well. Dear God, here's a poem. I love you because you give us what we need to live, but I wish you would tell me why you made it so we have to die. Isn't that a wise old soul? And they have magical thinking. The belief that unrelated events are casually or causally connected despite the lack of any logical link between them. And that's when it comes out that they believe that they did something wrong to cause their own illness or the illness or death of another. Um, they might have been naughty. They might have done, said something rude to someone. Um, they might have not done something they were asked to do. And when they get ill, they might think this is my own fault. But we also have this magical thinking and guilt that we call guilt in adulthood, that we were the cause of their illness or death. And they express themselves in so many different ways. It doesn't just have to be words. Words are wonderful when they can talk, but they can express themselves through art, through music. The way they bang on a drum can tell you a lot about how they are feeling. The way they dance, especially with our teenagers, and we have a poetry group that writes the most profound and beautiful poetry. And that's their form of expressing how they are feeling. So remember with children, we have to use all these different forms to actually communicate with them and for them to communicate with us. So we mustn't be afraid of getting down and getting covered in paint um, because that's part of the communication as well. Art, of course, is, is really important. And I think if we look at these two pictures, the picture above, which shows this child frightened, unhappy, because they've got to go to hospital. And that's why we have to dress down, dress casually, um, and not make them afraid of us, not come running to them with this uh, injection. Um, to the one at the bottom, where this young girl who was staying in Sunflower House and came in and out with diabetes um, drew it as this bright and happy place because even though it was a place of palliative care, she loved being there and she loved being with the other children, with the staff and with the volunteers. And this was a, a picture that a little girl drew who we were told knew nothing about her grandmother dying and when we asked her to draw something about her grandmother, she drew this picture of the angel going up to heaven and the, and the graves, which told us that this child knew exactly what was happening. And she was six years old. So the importance of play. And that's one of the fun things about being in children's palliative care is that we get to renew all our play skills as well, because if we don't play with the children, 
um, we're going to miss a lot of their communication. And even Albert Einstein, one of the great, great minds of all time said, play is the highest form of research. And so we can all do research if we can all play. And playing with children, and this is a picture that actually comes out of Afghanistan. And you can see how these children, even though they're in the midst of these, of this rubble, of these destroyed buildings, and the loss of so much in their lives, how they are reacting to something really, really simple, a puppet show by someone with a funny wig on his head who is just making them feel normal. It helps them to cope if we can help them feel normal. And so we don't put children separate from other children. They need to interact. They need to be with other children. They need to interact in normal society as far as possible. And so that if we play with them, if they feel comfortable with us, if they feel safe with us, then they might come to us and ask this kind of question that these little ones did to me in the garden of Sunflower House. They came and said to me, Sister Joan, what does it mean to be dead? Now, if somebody asks you that question, I'm just giving you a moment to think about it. How would you answer that if some children came to you and said, what does it mean to be dead? You can even put your answers in the chat. So first of all, you have to find out why they asked you that question. They might have found a dead frog in the garden. And having seen the frog, frog hopping along, might have wondered what had happened to that frog. So we ask them always, why do you ask me that question? That's an interesting question. Why have you asked me that question? These little children actually had come to me because we'd had a friend of theirs who died in the house. And when a child is dying, we always prepare the children who are friends um, because it's important that suddenly this little person who was there with them, even just in a cot, suddenly disappears. They want to know about that. And so they wanted to know what it meant that Basitsani had died. And so then I would ask them, what do they think? They were three and four years old. So they were young. But children of that age know, know a little bit about death and about um, people going away when they die. And so I asked them what they thought. And they said, well, we think she goes away somewhere, but we're not quite sure where and what it's like. And this is where we also have to be very honest with the children. And what I often respond is, I have never died, so I can't tell you from experience, but this is what I believe happens when you die. And you find children, first of all, they don't have a very long attention span. And so they don't want long theological um, explanations about uh, how the body changes, we become spirit, whatever their particular faith belief is, or your particular faith belief is, um, they want something very simple. So with these children who came from a Christian faith belief, I could say, I believe that then we go to heaven where we are well again and we are again perfect and we can move and we are healthy and we can be with the others who we love as well. And that is a simple explanation, but of course we're going to adapt it to your culture and to your faith beliefs as well. So these are the possible responses that, that we've spoken about. Why do you ask me that? What do you think? What made you ask that question? What have you been told? And they, if their family has a deep faith and they've been brought up in a, a religious tradition, then listen to them um, and affirm whatever they have been told. And as I said, I always admit, if I don't know. I think that's really important with children. If they're going to trust you, you have to say when you don't know. And then one of the questions that we so often got 
especially with our older children and teenagers during the time of HIV and AIDS, when so many children were dying and young people um, before we had antiretrovirals was, will you remember me? Who's going to remember me when I'm gone? And so we, um, we have an inpatient unit called Sunflower House and we painted a wall of remembrance in the playground. So these children knew that they would always be part of the life of Sunflower House. And we said to them, we'll never forget you because you're going to go, your name is going to go into a sunflower and you will be part of um, our hospice forever. So pain in children, and of course pain, um, you've learned about pain, you've learned about assessing pain, and I'm not going to go into it in great depth either, because that is more along the clinical side, but just to say, if you experience pain with something, a child will experience pain as well. And remembering that it is not only physical. Sometimes when we have um, a child whose pain is not well controlled, especially older children, we have to look at the other factors. Are there emotional, psychological factors? Fear, anger. Are there social factors? What is happening in their life around them? Are there cultural beliefs that they have? And are there spiritual beliefs? And so what we find often in Africa with a child who has an osteosarcoma is, and, and there has to be, um, or we advise an amputation, that because there is a belief that you cannot go to your ancestors if you are not whole, that families will pressure the child into not having an amputation. And we have to take that into account as well. So we deal with cultural aspects. And then of course, the spiritual aspect. Um, maybe an anger with God, maybe spiritual pain, Maybe it's just the spiritual feeling of what is happening? Where am I going? Why is it happening to me? And that great question that we all ask, which is why? And so with children, we should always use a pain assessment tool and a tool that, on, that doesn't only measure physical pain. We need a baseline and we need to continue using it regularly. So if, it, um, if you're a volunteer who's visiting, you need to be able to understand how to use a simple tool so you can report back to the medical team. And we always assess that child when they're resting and when they're acting. This is a, a tool that I like to use, the Elan body tool, very simple for the child to show you where their pain is. The revised faces pain scale, um, I'm not crazy about the pain scale if the child does not understand it properly, then we get false um, reporting from that pain scale as well. And with older children, the simplest is to use um, a numerical pain scale and we could, or we can ask them to use colors to describe their pain or keep a pain diary. For younger and nonverbal children, we have special scales that we can use that actually rely very much on observation. And um, Stefan Friedrichsdorf, who really is one of the greatest leaders in pain and symptom management in children with serious illnesses, he always says medication alone is not enough. What the first thing he, he says is that if we want to treat a child in pain, we have to look at multimodal analgesia, which is yes, we need to use medication, we, we recognize that but we need to try and give this child as normal a life as possible. If they can go to school, send them to school. Um, if they belong to a play group, let them belong to that play group because children are easily distracted from their pain as well. And to use other um, modalities such as play, um, a guided imagery, we can use, um, uh, music, we can use art, we can use dance, we can use movement, we can use massage, all of these things. Aromatherapy um, is also very good as well. Um, these are just the simple medications and if you look at them you can see they're very similar 
to what we use with adults as well. So all of the opioids can be used in children and more and more methadone is being used in acute pain management. And then we might use co-analgesics as well, such as gabapentin, amitriptyline and things like that, or even nerve blocks with children. And rehabilitation is very important. So physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, exercise, um, psych, uh, psychotherapy, important access to a chaplain for spiritual care or for someone trained in um, spiritual care. And then, of course, the other techniques such as mind-body techniques, breathing, blowing bubbles, very, um, very much accepted right across cultures with children, simple self-hypnosis, muscle relaxation, um, massage, and as I've said, things like aromatherapy, acupressure, acupuncture, and virtual reality as well, which is being used more and more, but is very expensive. And of course, playing games on a simple iPhone. So technology. Technology has become a really important part of palliative care for children. And you will see that all of the major UN agencies have departments that are looking at harnessing the power of technology, including UNICEF. And so we keep our eyes open for new resources, new ways of communication, and new technologies that we can use to help our children. And this is something that can be used even in humanitarian settings. We have here what they call the magic eye, where anyone can point this particular um, piece of equipment at a child, scan the child, and that information goes to someone who has expertise in palliative care. Uh, you probably have this in India as well as we're seeing in South Africa, is that it's a very different challenge that we're having now, especially we find with children on antiretrovirals and children on diabetic therapy. Um, and children with kidney disease as well, and on dialysis, is when they come from very poor families that have limited resources, they actually manipulate their condition so that they go back into hospital or back into the children's hospice, because there they know they're going to get lots of good food. If they want something, there's usually somebody who's going to get it for them. And um, they are very spoiled by the families, by the, by the staff, by the volunteers, with items that their families cannot afford. And so we have to be very careful of this. If you see a child coming in again and again, we have to then look at the social circumstances and do a lot of therapy with that child to try and get them past that. And so, as Matty Stepanek said, what about the end of life? that time that is very precious and where palliative care has to be really especially intense. There's an excellent, excellent um, study by Dr. Po Heng Chong that many of you may know from Singapore about a good death in the child with a life-shortening illness. And I would suggest that if you can get hold of a copy that you do read it. And he said what, what the steps are that he found were, first of all, letting go. That's very hard. It's very hard for the family. And it's even hard for the staff as well. When we've had a child in our care over many years, as many of you will see, um, especially with things like HIV, with cancer, with uh, organ failure, they may come in and out of our programs. But at some stage, we have to emotionally let go. We have to acknowledge that the child may know, may understand what is happening to them. And they often will tell us these stories. We have to prepare the family and the child themselves if they're old enough to understand for the closure. And how do we control? How, what control do we have and what is beyond our control? Those are issues that we have to identify. And then we have to always recognize that hope, the, the hope for a miracle is always there. It's there with the family, it's there with the child often, 
and it's there with the staff as well. And so we're dealing with this hope all along. Um, and then we've spoken about the different levels of awareness. And it's really important just to go back is I feel that the role of a chaplain or a spiritual supporter or counselor is essential when we are dealing with children, but it has to be someone who knows how to communicate with children. This is our sunflower um, chaplain at present, Father Lazarus Mahaffey, who's wonderful with our kids and who will come in any time of the day or night to be with them, to answer their questions or to be with them at the end of life as well. Um, and this is our very first chaplain, Father Keith Thomas, who, as you can see, had a very special relationship with children. You can just see the connection between him and little Lena. So we need to have these systems and processes in place in whatever program that we have, whether it's a program that is home-based care, daycare, or as we have home-based care and um, an inpatient unit, and by reducing the suffering, the holistic suffering, and allowing as much normality as possible, this brings comfort to the child. And that, of course, is our ultimate aim, that this child will be comfortable, comfortable in body, mind, and spirit. And there are cultural issues that come in as well. So if you go to one of the really beautiful 10-star children's hospices that you find in the United Kingdom, in the USA, in Australia, you will see one child in a room with everything that moves and opens and closes, a beautiful setting. But in Africa, children grow up in community. And if you put them in a room on their own, unless they really are end of life or they have an infection where they need to be isolated, and believe me, we had great problems isolating children during COVID. Um, they feel they're being punished. They want to be with other children. And so we allow them to be amongst the other children, as sick as they are, until we feel the end is really, really close by. And we can use the ABCD approach, which of course we always love something simple. The first is the advanced care plan. And that will tell us what we do and what we don't do. What are the child's wishes? Who will be with the child? Who are the key role players? What is needed in the advanced care plan? And what resources are there? And so even though we know that the child is um, who's under 18, they are not legally autonomous we need to take the child's wishes into account as well, as much as the adult wishes. And there can be times when what their parents want and what the child want, wants are very different, and we have to come in and mediate that situation. And we need to be connected. So every team member must be able to work with children. So this is the pharmacist, who would normally actually be working with the medications but she's every bit as good with the children as the nurses and the play therapists. Because in Africa, we say every child is my child, but also belongs to everyone else on the team. And so every, every member of the team needs to have this holistic training in palliative care. B is the big picture that we take. What will be the impact on the child and on others, the family, the friends, the school, the church, the community, and never forget the staff because staff grieve and, and love their children that they care for. I've said to you, we need to take into account cultural and religious issues. Are there certain activities that need to take place before the child dies at the time of death, immediately after the death? And so we need a deep understanding of what these issues are. We need to know who decides. Who is the legal guardian of this child? We often have problems with children who have been abandoned by perhaps the father, the mother is sick, you have aunts and uncles coming in, we have to find out who the legal guardian are. And then of course ethical issues which are often very difficult with children 
and what legacy actions can we do? So can we keep take photographs, um, especially when we think of these tiny little babies who die very young, taking footprints and handprints and maybe a cutting of their hair as well as photographs. Then communication, which we've spoken about a little bit, and who do we communicate with? There's also, don't forget the siblings and the grandparents. Um, you know, grandparents are worrying about their grandchildren who are sick. They're also worrying about their own child who is a parent of that sick child as well. And so when we communicate, we communicate at the end of life with gentle honesty. Honesty is important, but we present the honesty makes a difference. And we need to be prepared to explain and explain and explain all the time. Because when people are grieving, they often don't get the message the first time, they forget, they become disorganized and disorientated. And so if somebody asks you for the 20th time to explain what is happening, we do it in a gentle and in a patient way. And then of course, what about at the time of death, that very sacred and special time? Have the family been prepared? Do they know what to expect? Do they know what is going to happen in that little life that is, is slowly leaving the body? Are there religious rituals? Does this child need anointing? Should there be candles? Is there music that should go? Is there a way that the body should be pointing at the time of death? The faith leader involvement, it could be your, your chaplain, um, but very often it's their own faith leader if they have a close relationship. And then of course, the legal pronouncements around the death. We need to know that because so often I, I find people say to me, you know, when my child died, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who had to be called. I didn't know who could pronounce the death. Um, so make sure those things are all in place at the time. And something I learned very early on when I was dealing with children is that when a child dies, they don't have to immediately be taken away. The child's can lie there for as long as the family want the child to lie there. Um, so never rush to get an undertaker or whoever comes to collect uh, the, the, the little body after death. Um, and then of course, the care of that body after death and here cultural and religious issues might come in as to who looks after that, that little body. And bereavement. So bereavement support is essential. The gap that the death of a child leaves is huge. It is enormous. And it lasts throughout the parents and those who love the child throughout their lives. And it will, bereavement isn't something that happens in a straight line. When I started with hospice, we were told, at the time of death, just after the death, you will feel like this. After three months, you will feel like this. After six months, this is the way you're going to feel. And after a year, when you've got through all the anniversaries and the birthdays and those kind of things, then you'll be able to pick yourself and go on. And we know that that actually is nonsense. It doesn't happen like that. And the death of a child is a lifetime experience. And there will always be triggers that bring back the grief. And this to me is, it it's comes out of Ukraine and just a simple explanation of how children experience death. This is a little boy who'd lived in Mariupol, which of course was totally flattened during, um, in the early days of the war. And he drew this picture and you can see what he's drawn. You know, there's fighting, there's tanks, there's, buildings that have fallen down, there's frightened people in it as well. And he wrote, I have died two dogs, my grandmother, and the beautiful city of Mariupol. So all these different losses that the child has experienced as well. And they need to be, when they are facing grief and loss, the child needs to be accompanied. So often we forget about the children, if a child has died in the family, we're busy with the family, we're busy with the, with the parents, 
and we forget about the, the siblings as well. Um, and what about the child whose mother or father has died? We go to the funeral and you'll see everyone greeting uh, the remaining spouse and people forgetting the child. So we need to remember accompaniment is really important. Um, and last but definitely not least is spiritual assessment and care. How we help the child and the family to cope. And spirituality is more than religion. It's about meaning and purpose. What is the meaning of life? What is the meaning for that child? What is the meaning for the parents? What is their purpose in life? And everyone has a meaning and purpose in their life. So for a child, it might be waking up and deciding what they want to play today or who they're going to play with. For an adult, it could be about getting up and cooking breakfast and going out to work. And that's my purpose. Um, but every person's purpose and meaning in life is different. It's about connectedness. Connectedness to ourselves, to others, to God, or however we, we see someone or something greater than we are. It's about connectedness to nature. And that is so important at this time of so much uh, climate change, how we connect and remember that we are part of the whole of nature on this earth. It's about transcendence, the knowledge that there's something greater than we are. And it's about mystery and paradox. There's always something in spirituality that we actually can't, can't explain that something is different. And that's where, of course, faith and hope come into being. And there is this global consensus definition of spirituality, which talks about it as being dynamic, but also about being intrinsic aspect of who we are. And it's the way that we seek ultimate meaning, purpose and transcendence and experience relationship, which is connection to ourselves, to family, to others, to community, to society and nature, and to the significant or sacred. And we express our spirituality through our beliefs, which may be through our religious beliefs, through our values, through our traditions and practices. And why is it essential in palliative care for children? Because it's a part of holistic care, because children are spiritual beings, because it's an essential principle and practice of what we do. And because if we look at every accepted definition of palliative care, it includes spirituality and spiritual care. And yet, when I go through assessment forms, when I talk to teams, so often, this is the part that is left out, or it's left to, it's going to be the, the imam, the priest, um, the pastor who will do it. And we forget that we working in palliative care, we have a role as well. And then the ethical decisions about children's palliative care. The big one is autonomy. We say children only become autonomous when they turn 18. But when you're dealing with older children and teenagers, we have to listen to their voice as well. And we have to ask, what is in the child's best interest? Because remember, what we know and what the um, UN Convention on the Rights of the Child says that in every decision involving a child, their best interest is of the utmost importance. And in, uh, where there are differences in opinion between us as healthcare professionals, between us as a palliative care team and parents and the child, what we have to look for is not who knows best, but what is best for each child. And so, of course, we have wonderful resources that we can, we can get, um, not, the, not the Oxford textbook. That's a very expensive textbook. But actually, sometimes you can get parts of it on, um, on the internet. But these three uh, booklets that come from WHO, if you go into the WHO website and into the palliative care um, part, you will be able to download this one on integrating palliative care and symptom relief into pediatrics. And then the International Children's Palliative Care Network is wonderful 
free e-learning courses that cover a number of subjects. And they, um, there are one or two, I think, that are in Hindi at the moment. They're all in English, but there are other languages that some of them have been translated into. And if you go into the ICPCN website, all of their courses can be accessed. And as I say, they are free. There's a new online journal dedicated to palliative care for children. This is very new, it only came out last year. So we do have um, somewhere where we can actually have our, our research and our findings published. And so this is a question that we need to ask. In our hearts, we know that palliative care benefits children. We know this, we've seen it, we have lots of proof. So why do we allow the present situation to remain? And that says to us, we are all challenged to be advocates for children's palliative care. And we have to fight with our policymakers, with our governments and say, why is there not palliative care available for every child who needs it? Where is the money that's got to go into providing it? Where are the systems and structures in the health systems? Why is not everyone working in healthcare trained? And we need to have funded posts and a strategy and access to everything that the child needs. So remember, you are an advocate for children's palliative care. We need to remember that palliative hats on for children's palliative care. This year, it will be on the 13th of October. This was last year. Um, where we ask people to wear a hat to show solidarity with children's palliative care. And as Andrew Lake, who was the former CEO of UNICEF said, what we are doing in children's palliative care, what we have to do is to provide the quiet miracle of a normal life for a life that goes on for as long as possible so that they can live as well as possible. So thank you. If you have any questions, I will try to answer them. And um, you're welcome to email me or to send a WhatsApp at any time. Hi, um, do, do you have any questions? I see there's a question in the chat. Should I answer that yes. one first? Okay. Um, it comes from Rachel and she says, how can I who has completed our run of Palio India be an advocate for child palliative care? I do support a little extent in donating, collecting toys, art materials or pampers um, to programs run by Pallium India on Thursdays. I have joined Pal Chase too. Welcome, that's wonderful. You can, Rachel, you can join the advocacy group at Pal Chase um, if you would like to. If you would like to send me your, your email um, or go onto the Pal Chase website, then you can join the advocacy group because we have a strong group advocating for children. And if you if your daughter's going to settle in Scotland, she says my daughter might, might settle in Scotland by this year end, um, Scotland has a very, very strong children's palliative care network across the whole country. And so it's very easy if you go to Scotland to get involved there. But the way you can, um, you can be an advocate is to make sure that if you see that there are any policy makers that you know, or even if you don't know, you can write to them and say, we know that the children are not getting palliative care. We know that not all children who need it are getting palliative care. And what are you as a policymaker doing to make sure that not only you have a policy for access to children's palliative care, but that the government puts funding to it as well. Because one of our great problems is governments are wonderful at saying, yes, this is what we want. Um, this is what we want for our children. It's wonderful, palliative care, absolutely essential. They sign every convention that there is. And yet when you ask them to put money to it, they don't. 
So we have to keep on holding our policymakers to account and say, yes, you signed the, the World Health um, convention, uh, convention. You signed um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. You have signed to provide universal health coverage, which includes palliative care and palliative care for children. Why aren't you doing something practical about it? You know, there, there aren't the posts, there isn't the money going to it that we need. And we shouldn't be depending the whole time on NGOs to provide palliative care. It is a government responsibility. And I feel very strongly. Mansi, I see you have a question. Hi, Joan. Hi, so good to see you. So good We've to been see friends you. for a very long time. I know. <laughs> <laughs> really great to see you. And I was I was very excited when I got to know it's your session today. <laughs> um, Joan, my question is very similar to what Rachel asked, but uh, just with the concern, and I think that's that has been my question throughout. Uh, whenever I have raised a question in this group during the class, um, it's about you know advocacy is one thing, but how how do we work towards awareness? And I see I think there is a great scope um, in in the group that we have right now because there are so many people who are actually working on palliative care and believe in it. But I think um, like today I had a call with uh, Howard. And when we were talking about the kind of work we do, um, he also, we realized that we are basically taking care of all the aspects of palliative care for children, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but how do we spread awareness and how do we make people join the movement? Because that has been a struggle and even telling people about the concept of palliative care, which um, in the minds of most people is really flawed. Um, even in the yeah. minds of medical professionals, it's really flawed. Like, how do we uh, clear that out? And that has been our struggle since the beginning. Yeah, Mansi, I think that you, what, you, what you've highlighted is a problem that we have across palliative care globally. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're looking at specifically at children's palliative care, there is a global group now looking at how do we sell children's palliative care? Okay. So I think, first of all, I mean, where are you creating awareness? We're creating awareness. We want it to be at community level because we need the voice of the community saying to government that we need palliative care. My child needs palliative care. We need more voices of parents and older children. I think we, you know, we so we're the professionals, we're the people who run programs. And whose voice do we hear? You hear our voice. What we really need are the voices of the children and their families, um, because they make more of an impact. And as you know, when we did that development program in Maharashtra, um, we actually pushed for some of the children and parents to speak to the policy makers. And we were doing it alongside a program in Malawi. And that was what made the Malawian government actually as poor as they are, and it's a really poor country, Malawi. They actually put it into government policy and gave money to it. Um, and if I can tell you that we need it from, from all levels. So we need a voice coming from the community. And that voice needs to be the people who've, who are affected or who have been affected. But we also need that higher voice at political level. And that's where it's really important that we know what are the are the UN declarations and policies, um, like the World Health Assembly um, declaration of 2014. India signed it, South Africa signed it. Mm -hmm. um, we need to say to them, you signed this to say that it was essential to healthcare. Palliative care is part of universal health coverage. India signed it, South Africa signed it as well. We need to hold them to account because it's not enough to say we have a policy. We think it's a great thing. We think it's essential. So I think you've got to work with, you've got wonderful young people in your program. Let them speak. Let them be the people who say we need, of course you do palliative care, Muncie. You've done it from the beginning. You've given this holistic care to these children with, mostly with chronic conditions like HIV. Um, let them be your voices. Let them speak to the politicians. 
let them speak on radio and on television. That's a great point. But hold your government to account because they are accountable. And as I've said, universal health coverage includes palliative care and includes children. There's no, we just have to keep on fighting. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a global group that is looking at why are we marketing it wrongly? We need to market it better. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. And then I have, you know, um, who asked about, Rich, was that about pranic healing? I have to be absolutely honest. I don't know about pranic healing. So I would love to hear a little bit about it. Mind me drinking my lovely coffee that my friend who's given me the use of her internet has brought me as well. <laughs> would someone like to, to explain pranic healing to me? Is that Rachel? Do we have any other questions or any other comments? As I realized, you know, I had to cover a very big subject in a very short time. And so we've only just touched on it. Um, can you hear me? Rachel? Hi, Rachel. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, so I was uh, having, a, I am a patient of rheumatoid arthritis since the age of 26. I am now 61 by God's grace. Wow. Uh, so I used to follow that. So that helped me tide over the many decisions and uh, obstacles in my life, in my career, because I was working with the Department of Space here. So I, I could do it very, what do you call, very happily uh, with all the practices of pranic healing. It's a holistic approach. And uh, again, I think I am going back uh, to the practices like meditation so that uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, it would be a better place and better practice to bring uh, positiveness to the people around me and to myself. So I Thank was you. just thinking, okay. Yeah, there no, might be many other, yes. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it definitely has a role to play. Um, and yes. I think that it's important that we look at all these different types of what are healings, like meditation, um, yes. as you say, is, is really something that helps people to cope spiritually and emotionally. Yes. what is happening yes. so i think yes. meditation mindfulness um, yes you know so many of these practices that really come from um from actually ancient times a lot of them yes yes and um, we need to integrate them and that's why we talk about integrative medicine where we integrate all these different types of healing along yes. with good medical of course good medical care the use of, of medications Yes, yes. So I was just thinking whether holistic approach is also done uh, for this palliative care for children. Yes, yes. And I think we need to remember, you know, one aspect I didn't even touch on, which of course I should have because we're dealing with young people, is the issue of sexuality as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it doesn't, the, the hormones don't stop because they've got a, a chronic life limiting condition and they grow and develop. Um, the emotions and everything and how do we deal with that with our teenagers so that's a subject on its own and it's an important subject because for our young people that is a very very important aspect yes. um, and if we you know we try and hide ourselves because we're uncomfortable yes. about talking mm -hmm. about it and if we don't let them talk about it that's a, that's going to be suffering that they experience that we're not helping them with Yes. Um, and if, if I have I just a moment to tell you how it really hit home with me, I had this beautiful young girl who had cancer and uh -huh. she'd been tiny, slim, had lovely long hair. She used to dance, play the piano, very artistic. And she had a, a brain tumor that was diagnosed and she lived actually for six years after the diagnosis. She had radiotherapy, she had surgery, she had chemo. And of course, on high doses of cortisone. So by the time she was 16, she lost her hair. She was, you know, lots of cortisone. So she was big. Um, and she became blind because the tumor grew and affected her, her sight as well. And we were sitting 
in, in the lounge one day, I was visiting her as, as her hospice nurse and some music came on and she said, oh, Auntie Joan, I love this. And she stood up and she gave the most sensual dance that I've ever seen. It was beautiful to watch, beautiful. She used her whole body to move to this music. And that was when it really hit home. There's an aspect of Susan that I'm not dealing with and that we need to talk about. Um, so, so that is, is an area, as I say, of its own that we need to remember, we need to include in holistic care as well, no matter how uncomfortable we might feel about it. Are there any other comments or questions? And as I say, you're very welcome to email me or WhatsApp me at any time. My voice is audible, John. Yes, 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 I can hear you. Thank you. I'm so sorry I joined a little late. So I guess a lot of important slides have gone by. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to request if you can scroll through the slides and if you have got some one or two pointers, in case if you have not explained, you can explain them. Is it a good suggestion? Because we are waiting for the questions. If you can just okay. scroll through the slides once. Okay. If there's something that hits the eye, then I'll just like, you know, probably try to or someone else also may have something that if you have not explained because the recordings come to us. So it's very sorry to ask again the same thing does not make sense. Okay, so we can, <laughs> I'll just scroll slowly, through. Yeah. yeah. Is that? Mm -hmm. This is good. Just go a little slow. Okay. Mm. Okay. Uh, please forgive me if I'm asking the question again. In India, where all do we have like children's palliative care units? Maybe you've already told. If you've told, then don't answer me. Um, or those who are no, present I, on I haven't. No, I haven't. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know where all of them are now, but of course you've got really, I mean, your, um, your early programs came out of Hyderabad and, and out of Mumbai as well, but they have spread around, around the country. Um, I mean, you've got the, the but Golden Butterflies, which is a, a more recent program. Um, mm -hmm. you, as I say, I don't know where all the programs are in India. And I think if you went to the Indian Association of Palliative Care, they would have a list of where the programs are around the country. Okay. But of course, they should be wherever the children are. They Ideally, and they would be everywhere, I guess, like, you know, at least... Some there regional should center. Hmm. There should be regional centers, but you've got such a huge country and such a huge population yes. as well. Yes, a and diverse that, one. <laughs> that you, you're hopelessly, well, as we are across the world, you know, the only countries that really have a good network across the country, of course, the United Kingdom does. It has an excellent network across um, across the whole country. Um, but if you go to the Malawi, strangely enough, but it's a small country. Yeah. If you think of, of how many children and how many people there are in India, in Malawi, it's 15 million. You know, you're over a billion. Um, okay. So it's, um, but the networks, in fact, the countries that are growing and developing, so Costa Rica, in Latin America. Okay. Um, America has really good um, spread throughout their hospitals and healthcare systems, but very few children's hospices. Canada's got quite a good um, spread and Australia as well. But the rest of the world, it's still very much isolated programs, but it is developing, it is getting better. Um, but very hard in humanitarian crises. Are there some questions here? I'm just looking at the chat. Sorry, I can't see. 
Oh, here we are. That's wonderful. Here we are. That's there's some yes. Um, I see that. Uh, Nancy, can you put the address of Happy Feet Home? Someone's already, already done have. that. I see you have. You have that. Uh, someone's already done that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very yeah, much. That's great. It's wonderful. But I think it's, you know, it's good to find out where your local one is. Yeah. And I hope that you'll connect with each other. I think that's really important as well, that we, that we connect with each other. But Happy Feet Home is lovely because it's a, it's a daycare program. Muncie, would you like to just explain a little bit about your program? Yeah. Sure. So we are a we are a daycare program. We work with children from uh, one of the municipal hospitals in Mumbai, and we work with children who have uh, HIV, thalassemia, and cancer so far. Uh, what we do is, uh, when it comes to medical care, that's taken care by the hospital, and we have a full time nurse. So medical care is one aspect of our uh, services that we give. But the other aspects is, we take care of nutrition, we take care of medical medicine, we take care of education and vocation, even the mental health um, our basic uh, objective is to ensure that children get the nurture and nourishment of palliative care um, so that they can they are they are unable to live happy and empowered lives so basically our end goal is to let our children see if, to, to take our children to a space where they do not need happy feet home ever you know um, these this is for children who who are on active treatment who have good prognosis uh, we also we also look into the end of life care but um, that's more with like you know fulfilling wishes or giving them like like joan mentioned uh, to help them die gently uh, we do that too but uh, since it is hiv and thalassemia that's our core uh, group uh, we do have the uh, flexibility or the opportunity to work with children in terms of planning their lives and helping them design their own lives that's our basic uh, idea thank you mansi and it's a lovely program and the nice thing about daycare program is that it keeps the children in their own home, but it gives them a safe space where they can be evaluated, assessed, um, helped and supported, and they can go home afterwards. So I think that, you know, I'm, I'm very, um, very passionate about the daycare programs. I think that we, we should think about them more. Of course, they, they are less expensive than to have an inpatient unit, which is a very expensive thing. It's the most expensive part of providing a hospice and palliative care um, service. If I can ask a question about the previous slide, there were some tools mentioned. Yes, there we go. Uh, yeah, uh, if, if you've spoken about these tools, then don't care to answer them again. But have you spoken about the pain assessment tool? Like, how do we do this? Meaning, if um, you I want spoke to... about the tools that you can use um, and that it's really important that the child using the tool or the parent using the tool, who, if it's say a home care child, understands how to use it because we often have, especially the faces scale, you know, we all know the old faces, the Baker Wong faces, is that unless the child understands that these expressions identify the level of pain that they have, they, I find that I've gone into places where they say, oh no, the child says they've got no pain or hardly any, because they actually like the face that's smiling a bit. But actually their pain might be more like a six. But because they're saying, oh no, my pain's a two, because they like that face, it shows they don't understand it. So that when you're using a scale, you've got to understand it properly, and the child has got to understand it as well. And um, the most validated scale actually is the flex scale that you can use for young children, um, but you can also use it for, for children or older children who are nonverbal as well. And they use it sometimes for nonverbal adults as well. It's a very validated scale, the flex scale. How do we use it? Forgive my ignorance. 
Okay, so the flag scale, and, and you can Google it because it's, it's, as I say, it's the most validated scale, is you look, you look at the child. So you look at their face and the expression on their face. Is it quite calm and you know, relaxed and everything? Or do they scrunch up their face and eyes? It, it will tell you, it gives you the different levels to look for. You look at their legs, are they, their legs drawn up to their abdomen? Are their legs relaxed? What is the position of their legs? What is the uh, movement of their legs? It looks at the activity of the child. Is it normal activity? Are they lying nice and relaxed or moving in a relaxed way? Or are their, um, are their movements very sort of sharp and tense? Crying, of course, is important. And then consolability. Is it easy to console the child if you pick them up and cuddle them? Do they stop crying? Or even though you've done a few interventions, they, they're still crying a lot, which shows they've got heart pain. But if you, if you look up the scale um, on Google, you'll find lots of copies. It's very, it's very well explained on the tool. Uh, Joan, if I can take a second, uh, um, uh, Rachel, I had a question about pranic healing. I just wanted to, while we are talking, we don't, we are not into pranic healing or the, anything like that, but we do use various forms of uh, um, uh, forms of art, like whether it is movement and dance, whether it is just art-based therapy. Right now, if I were to just, I can't share my screen. I just want to show mm -hmm. while we are in the session, uh, we have our children, have, they have a, we have an external facilitator who comes every Wednesday and does uh, meditation and yoga and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and Joan, we've uh, recently even extended, like we are extending to different hospitals and we're also doing like community-based outreach. So Fantastic. just to, thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, and just remember those of you who want to go into children's palliative care, that we all start small. We all start small. But if you've got the vision and the passion, there's lots of resources and lots of people that you can contact who can advise you, who can support you, who can say, you know, don't go that route because we, you know, when we tried it, we found it was too expensive. The children weren't keen. Think about this. So you've got wonderful, wonderful resources within India in so many different places now that um, if you want to, to get a program started or you want to integrate it into an existing adult program, our children's hospice started as part of an adult program. And then because the numbers were growing and of course with AIDS, the numbers just shot up, that we then started a separate children's program. But um, there's no reason why you can't integrate it into an adult program as well. Because children grow from you know, there's they that difficult, you know, once they hit 17, 18, and they've grown up, they feel they've grown up, there are lots of things you can do with them. And palliative care is very much more similar to adult palliative care than that child of 10. Um, so that's why we have to, you know, we have to see what is best for the child. Sometimes that child might be better off in an adult program because they have the resources to deal with those other children. But you do, you have amazing programs. If I think of, of Mumbai and, you know, what you've got in Mumbai, um, of course, my dear friend, Dr. Marianne Mukaden, who got the program started at Tata and how that program has continued. Uh, and then, of course, Dr. Gayatri Palat in Hyderabad. I mean, she's renowned for the work that she has done in children's palliative care as well. And then so many others across the country who have been great advocates and who are providing brilliant palliative care. So it's, you know, you should be able to contact someone in your region and otherwise contact the Indian Association of Palliative Care because they will have the list there as well. So uh, I think uh, we can wind up the session. And uh, um, uh, surely it was an inviting session. And uh, I think all have uh, cleared their doubts as well. And if you have anything else, you can always indulge.
Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much from the team uh, for this inviting session and uh, for the participants as well. And for the next session, we also request you to uh, please turn on your videos as well and uh, respond properly. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. It was indeed a pleasure meeting with you and having a wonderful session as well, because always your sessions are a maximum guarantee that it is going to be effective. So no exception today as well. Thank you so much. And thank you for being so much uh, patient with uh, that unusual request from uh, Ms. Sheetal to go through the entire deck once again. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much once again, John. <laughs> and it's really a great pleasure. It's really a sincerely and... hope that everyone, including Sheetal ma'am, finds time to log into the session in on time so that uh, we take more time for the valuable discussions which follow rather than browsing through the slides again. So thank you everyone for joining in and making this session interactive. This is Shripriya along with John Marston, Mr. Arub and Ms. Deepa Jo signing off from the Tipsy Hub. See you all in the next session. Till then, stay connected, be happy, keep spreading happiness. Bye-bye.